In some cruising circles, saying the P word is a no-no, a turn-off, and a word that should never be used if you're trying to encourage people into the offshore cruising life. But I've always had a big problem with that. To me, performance is not necessarily about straight line speed. It's not always about racing. And it's not about push, push, push. Instead, performance starts with a boat that's well balanced, a boat that's easy to handle. And with those two characteristics, a boat that not only eats up the miles, but does so with the minimum of stress. That's what performance should mean. For 37 years, the French company has staked its reputation on creating blue water cruising cats where the P word is at the heart of the concept. One of their most popular models has been the Outremer 55, with 80 sold since 2021. And now they've just launched a new 52 footer, which has already been staggeringly successful. Over 60 boats have been sold since the model was first announced. So to find out how and why the latest cat has proved so popular before it even hit the water, we've come to Outremer's home, La Grande Motte in the south of France. And to kick things off, we're heading offshore for a couple of days to get stuck in. So we left La Grande Motte about half an hour, 40 minutes ago. We're now a couple of miles offshore where the conditions have really picked up in this offshore breeze. We're just going past Port Camargue. We're going to turn around the headland and then head east up towards Marseille, up to the Friol Islands, which is about 70 miles away. And at 10 knots, that shouldn't take too long at all. The Outremer 52 was designed by VPLP, along with Patrick Lecamel and Franck Darnay Design, a hugely experienced team. But on the face of it, when you look at Outremer's modest production range that starts with a 45-footer and ends with a boat just 10 foot bigger at 55 foot overall, you might wonder why they felt the need to create a new one that was just over one foot longer than the boat it replaces. We did too. And when you get underway, you realise something else first. Why Outremer are so popular. We've been cracking along for a couple of hours now and uh, the breeze has come up. In fact, it's come up quite a lot. And we've got gusts of up to 29 knots at times, which has made it quite fruity. The sea state's got quite entertaining as well. But we are still cracking along at 10 or 11 knots. Very impressive. It's such a sure-footed feel on this boat and a really nice boat to helm as well. And just in case you're thinking, well, come on, I know about Outremer, I need some comparisons. Well, I have one for you because just to lured is an Outremer 55. We're actually doing this as a double act to get some kind of comparison. And the 55 is obviously a little bit bigger, but we've just been tracking alongside her now for a couple of hours. There's not much difference in speed, even though this is a smaller boat. One of the things that's particularly interesting about this boat right from the off is the steering. Because it's not quite what you'd expect. Yes, it's very comfortable. Yes, it's in a great place. You can see forward, very comfortable seating here. But it's also a very innovative arrangement because this whole pedestal actually rotates all the way in. In fact, it's got, I think it's four positions. We'll show you some of that a little bit later. But that's not all. Because interestingly, whilst you might expect to find this on the other side of the boat, it isn't. Because on the port side of the boat, you get this, a carbon tiller. Which is quite a lot of fun. We've actually got quite a big swell running down here and we're surfing down the waves. It's a big boat to be handling on a tiller, but it's good fun. It's easy to do. You certainly get into the, get into the groove of it going downwind. But why would you want to have a boat with asymmetric steering? Well, there are a number of reasons. According to Outremer, and I have no reason to doubt them, these are blue water cruising boats that spend most of their lives on autopilot. So actually, in many ways, it doesn't matter where the steering position is. And certainly, if you look across, I'd say probably the majority of the multi-hull cruising scene, certainly the cruising cats, you'll find steering positions that are offset anyway. So maybe it's not that different in the first place. The other reason they say that they didn't offer the wheel that you've got on the starboard side on the port side was because to do that would use up quite a lot of space in the cockpit and compromise 
some of the bits that they're really justifiably quite proud about, including a really nice walkthrough into the cockpit area. This whole area works so well. So they would, would have had to have compromised that. And actually, having a tiller is a bit of fun. And anybody who knows Outremers will know that a lot of their boats, particularly boats like the 4X, had a was a tiller steer boat and a lot of fun to sail as well. So it's not really that big a break from tradition. In fact, you could argue it's exactly what they're about. But it's certainly an interesting way of doing it. We're about seven or eight miles away from our anchorage just off Marseille and the breeze has dropped out and I'm pleased to say the sea state has calmed down as well. Although we do have this very long sweeping swell behind us which is allowing us to surf down the waves which is a bit of fun as well. But with the decrease in the breeze we then furled up the staysail, pulled out the big headsail and chucked out the two reefs in the main. All of which was dead straightforward. All of which was performed from right in front of me. Very easy, very straightforward. We're now, as I say, sailing in left breeze, but we're actually sailing quicker. We are over 10 knots all the time. We've hit a peak speed of just over 13 knots and the boat is so well balanced. Not that she wasn't before, but you can just feel how that extra knot of speed and the balance between the main and the jib has given her that really nice, sensitive and direct feel. And that's got me thinking about that P word all over again, because that's what performance is about, for me anyway. It's a beautiful boat to sail, particularly now, it's very well balanced, we can surf down waves. And when you look at the boat from off the boat and you look at that big powerful sail plan and the big square top main, you can see where she generates her power and her performance from. But it's all very, very manageable indeed. After a day of downwind fun, we arrived at the Friol Islands just off Marseille, which, aside from creating an opportunity to admire her at rest, also gave me the chance to take a closer look at her accommodation. If you're familiar with the Outremer 51, one of the things that you'll notice straight away on the 52 is that the entrance into the boat is very different. On the 51, it's a conventional onto the side deck and then down into the cockpit area. Whereas on the 52, they've engineered a really nice walkway through. So it's a much easier passageway through into the cockpit area. The second thing you'll notice is that whilst it feels very secure and very enclosed, which were characteristics that Outremer wanted to bring across from the 51 that were very popular, you'll notice it's the same kind of feel in here, but there's a lot more space. One of the favorite places uh, to sit is here and I particularly like this is a bar it's basically a bar stool area looking forward but where you can eat and look forward you have a fantastic view out through these windows all the way around I mean you have really really good visibility and the other thing that strikes you straight away is these big wide open doors so you've got this sort of patio door that comes to the center here but you've also got sliding windows that come basically you lift up this section here and these windows slide out so you can close this all off and secure it all off but when it's open it's a fantastic open space and it really makes that connection between the saloon and the galley area and the living space outside you've almost doubled your space by doing that the galley well for someone as greedy as me it looks superb it's huge <laughs> there's so much workspace here and um, this particular boat is set up with gas and electric hob. It's got an oven. We have a, a freezer over in the corner. This is a freezer here. We have a fridge over here, big fridge here. So what else? Well, we've got the navigation station, which sits central in the saloon area. Uh, again, great visibility, looks forward, chart plotter, radio, all the comms you want, power down here but it also acts as a as a workstation as well and then just over in this corner here then we've got the sort of saloon the main saloon area at the moment this table is down in its sort of coffee table configuration but you can lift that up open it out it even forms a bed here so you've got a nice big space 
Right, let's go and have a look down in the hulls. Um, this boat is set up as a three cabin configuration. So we'll go and have a look in the, uh, in the starboard hull, which on this boat is the owner's cabin. What strikes you straight away is the visibility. Again, you're going to hear this quite a lot on the Neutromare, but, but you've got these lovely windows out the side. And from your berth, you have a fantastic view outside. So long as you've managed to anchor in a fantastic place, of course. But lovely visibility, uh, very spacious. One of the things they've done this time around is actually they've lowered the height of the berth. Apparently on the 51, it was quite high. And that was to do with the size of the bulkhead that was required. It needed to be quite a high bulkhead for structural reasons, which meant the berth was quite high. And um, some of the owners said that they would prefer it a little bit lower. Well, on this boat, uses carbon fiber uh, bulkheads for the main structural bulkheads and they've been able to lower the berth down which gives you that bit that, that extra feeling of space down here more volume on that theme we've got a lot of stowage here there are great big uh, lockers here uh, apparently you can this one you won't be able to see when i open the door but basically in here is where you can have a washing machine or those uh, kind of facilities in here. Plenty of space. You've got another one up here. There's just lots of space all around, including stowage space under the floor as well. There's plastic boxes uh, and areas there for stowage and indeed under the berth at the back. So <laughs> you're not short of stowage space on this boat at all. Right, further up here. A giant hotel style heads and shower unit. Really nice. Plenty of space. Nice big sink. Nice to see, I have to say, nice to see a sink that is actually quite deep. That the water's going to stay in there. You'd be surprised at the number of boats that we go and test that have got very pretty looking sinks on them that are like shallow dishes you heel over and the water just comes straight out. Nice to see it. Ironic that it's on a boat that doesn't heel. But anyway, there we go. And up here, well, I'll stand in there to show you. <laughs> Huge, great big shower stall. I mean, I'm only a shorty, but it's a massive shower stall and really, really comfortable. One other thing I like, a little bit cheeky, but I think this has to be the best view from the smallest room in the house that I've ever come across. Quite remarkable. You don't need to bring a newspaper in here. Okay, let's go and have a look on the other side of the boat, in the other hull. So, as I say, this boat is a three cabin configuration. And so we have one cabin forwards, um, which is a double. A little bit smaller than the, than the aft one, but of course this is the forward cabin. But it's still got plenty of light, plenty of ventilation. So this is the guest cabin. It's the same proportions, the berth is the same proportions as the owner's cabin. Again, plenty of light, plenty of space, plenty of ventilation, lots of stowage. It really is a very nice space indeed. So there we have it. That is the interior of the 52. I have to say, I really like it. I think it's a very clever mix of stylish design, but most of all, practical, uh, a practical approach to what you're going to need for blue water cruising, where space and visibility are two of the key factors. And this 52 has got it in bucket loads. The 51 was and is a great boat, hugely popular, and when you're on it you can see why. But this is a step up of that, there is no doubt. After a very convivial evening where we tested entertaining to the full, it was time to get back underway for the return passage. Yesterday was a bit of a baptism of fire, but she certainly performed extremely well. But today she's revealing a different side and it's very impressive. Because for a lot of people, it's what happens in the light airs that probably counts for a bit more. How early do you have to actually put those engines on? How little breeze can you sail in? Well, the answer's revealing itself this morning. We started off with about five or six knots of breeze and she ghosted along at three or four knots quite happily. But as the breeze came up to what it is now, 12 knots, we're going upwind at uh, nine knots in 12 knots of breeze at a true wind angle of 67 degrees. 
that's pretty good for any cat. And the reason for that, well, apart from the superb sail plan, is the dagger boards. On the leeward side, we're fully down, and she draws a staggering 2.6 metres. That's why she goes upwind. As we made our way back out into open waters, the breeze and sea state started to build again. But this time, we were hard on the wind. We've had quite a variety of conditions, largely in sea states. And that's been particularly interesting aboard this boat. Because whilst the sea state is flat and we've got about 15 to 17 knots of breeze now, 10 minutes ago it was a very different story. We had over 20 knots of breeze and a much bigger fetch and bigger waves and a very awkward sea state to get over. And we were going dead upwind. And that appears to be where this boat really excels. Outremer have always made a big thing about their boats going wind in 20 to 30 knots true and I can see why because as we were sailing upwind in that difficult sea state you could really feel the influence of the dagger boards every time we came over a wave and down the other side you just need to put the bow down a little bit press on the board the boat would accelerate and off you go again it was a very satisfying experience if I'm honest what about that innovative steering system well essentially there are four positions for it there's this one where you're sitting outboard, looking ahead. There's this one, where you're close to the controls and the autopilot, you have a perfect view all the way around, great for manoeuvring. There's this one, which is halfway between inside and out. And then there's fully enclosed. It's quite cosy. Okay, let's have a look at some of the detail now. I mean, bearing in mind that this sail handling area is just in front of the wheel, so you can easily step forward, no problem at all. So, it's pretty straightforward. We've got the self-tacking jib sheets on the outside. We've got the staysail halyard there. We've got the conventional jib sheet for the overlapping headsail here. And then this winch, which is powered, it's got buttons down here. You can have any of these winches powered. On this particular boat, it's just this one here. If it was mine, I'd have that one powered as well, but there we go. Then moving in, we've got reefs one, two, and three, and then this is the main sheet. So it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you can control the main sheet from here very easily. In fact, you can control pretty much everything from here, and you are just a step in front of the wheel. But, I hear you say, what happens if you've got the wheel inside and you're sailing the boat from down there. It's quite ingenious because basically you take the jib sheet around this winch, it goes through a turning block there, it basically goes down around another turning block and onto a winch on a pedestal or a plinth just down by the steps. It's a very clever solution and very simple as well. So back here in the aft port quarter we've got controls for the mainsail. We have main sheet traveller here, pretty straightforward. One red line, one green line, up, down the traveller. Very easy, particularly easy to get it up the traveller because it's a powered winch. We've also got a main sheet down here as well. So when the whole cockpit area is enclosed, you can control the main sheet from here. When it comes to her layout up forward, she's pretty straightforward. She's got a detachable furling staysail here that we were using yesterday on a pro furl furler. We've got another furler here, conventional furler for the normal Genoa. And then off the bowsprit, another pro furl furler for the kite and the Code Zero. All pretty straightforward, really. So is when it comes back here, the stowage has got just loads and loads stowage plenty there water tank on that side anchor stowage as you'd expect to find down there and then on the other side is pretty much the same and there's even more stowage in the forward sections in both bows there's loads of it plenty of space for sails warps anchors uh, fenders whatever you like in fact to be honest i wouldn't be at all surprised if some people choose to turn these one of these at least into a cabin at least short-term cabin but what's interesting about this boat 
is they're actually the most significant bits, at least I think some of the most significant bits, are the bits you can't necessarily see. Yes, you can see the mast, of course, but this is a carbon mast. Now, it comes standard with an alloy mast, but Outremer are very keen to push the carbon one. And the reason? Because with this one, you save 160 kilos. That is a lot of weight to save and has a, a big effect on that P word, the performance word. But that's not the end of it. What's interesting about this boat is that when you compare this to the 51, which is the boat it replaces, this boat was always intended to be wider, to be a, a better performing boat. But wide means lots more material and more material means more weight. So when they looked at the weight studies, they realized that unlike the 51, which is a completely glass boat, this boat, to save weight, they were gonna make the main structural bulkheads in carbon fiber. Come standard like that, and it saves a whopping 600 kilos. Yep, 600 kilo saving by putting carbon bulkheads in. So you put 600 kilo saving there, 160 kilo saving there, and you begin to see why this boat performs like it does. And if you really want to go to town on saving weight, you could always tick an optional extra box to have a carbon coach roof. That'll save you 100 kilos. When it comes to power, solar is quite an important part of it on this boat. As you can see, there are solar panels on top of the bimini. In fact, the bimini was made just that bit bigger to be able to accommodate nine panels on the top here. And then there's four on the davits further aft. And combined, that's sufficient to generate between two and three kilowatts. But that still left one big question. How she built? To find out, we took a look behind the scenes. The process starts here. The 52 is built using four moulds, and this is one of them. This is the inside face of the starboard hull. It goes all the way over to the other side and the inside face of the port hull. At the moment, you can see that there's gel coat, and gel coat is the standard finish for the Outremer range. It's robust, it's easy to fix, and it's a well-proven way of doing it. The next stage in the process is to create the laminate itself. Now, Outremer have been using in the infusion process for many years. In fact, they started way back in 2001, so they're experts in this field. This is the underside of the deck, and the, uh, it's getting ready to be infused. The blue matting that you see is there to help the resin flow through the laminate, and the black pipes are where the resin actually flows through in the infusion process. But as you can see, it is a big area to infuse all in one go. Once the infusion process has taken place and it's all fully cured, then the mould is separated. We have the mould on one side and the hull on the other. Once the hull is out of the mould, then it's time to start putting in the main structure into the boat. And you can see the longitudinal elements and then these bulkheads that all go in. Now, a couple of things that are particularly interesting here is that when you look at all of the structure that goes into the boat, it is all not just bonded in, but it's laminated in as well. The other thing that's really interesting at this stage is you can clearly see the carbon bulkheads. There's three of them in total, one here, one there. There's actually another one just behind where the camera is over there. They're the three main carbon elements in this boat. The other interesting point that we see at this stage of build is you start to see the daggerboard cases going in. So you can see how tall they are. And that shelf down there is the structural part. So that's where the top of the daggerboard ends up. So it's supported between that shelf and the bottom of the boat. And you can see from there just how big that daggerboard is. Now, the next stage of the boat sees some of the pipework and the conduits and some of the internal framework go in and amongst that you can see the floors, the aluminium box section floors are going in down there onto which the wooden floors sit on top. But the other thing that's very noticeable is you can see that the daggerboard casing has now taken on its final form. It's all properly glassed in. You can see a black strap of carbon that goes around and that's the top of the load point that we've been talking about for the daggerboard. 
There's a good example here of some of the weight saving. This is one of the floors and you can see the laminate here, but with the foam core in the middle, keeping the weight down. The deck has now gone on, that's fully bonded to the hull and the fit out, the internal fit out is now well underway. And there's a couple of things I want to show you down here. If we go down into the cabin on the starboard side in the aft section. One of the really interesting things to come out of our sailing trials was that despite the nasty choppy seas and the pounding that we took upwind for a while, there wasn't any creaking or groaning down below. Now the reason for that is that all the joiner work inside an outremer is not connected directly to the hull or the structure inside. Instead, they've got a very ingenious way of creating a sort of shock absorber between the joiner work uh, and the hull and the structure itself. It's as true for the lockers as it is for the bulkheads, but the bulkhead here is a very good example of that. So if you come around and have a look here, you can see in the middle here is the carbon bulkhead. That's the structural member of the boat. Then either side of it, there's foam, then Sikaflex, then another layer of foam, and then on the outside is where the laminate is, the actual joiner work is, and it's all bonded and hung off there. Moving on to another boat on the production line, this one has got its Bimini installed and the interior fit out continues, but there's something I want to show you just down on this one in the port hull uh, forwards. This on, on the boat that we tested was a forward double cabin, but actually some people would choose to turn it into an office or a workshop. And this is one of those uh, options. And so this is the office desk here. Um, it's also got a, this here, I shan't pull it down, but this is actually a fold out bed that comes out the side. So you can convert this to a single bunk cabin. And then you've got lots of stowage up here and lots of space to store stuff. So it's easy to imagine this as being a really handy little office or workshop, of course. And I wouldn't mind betting that quite a, pe quite a few people, particularly those who are going off on a world cruise, choose this option. Why wouldn't you? It takes around eight months to build a 52, and with over 60 of them ordered already, it looks like they're going to be very busy here for quite some time. And if you want one, there's going to be a rather long queue. Anyway, let's get back on the water. The arguments for a multi-hull are well known. Space, volume and practicality, to say nothing of the lack of heel. But often there's a price to pay when it comes to the sailing experience. Too often the feel is a bit numb, not real sailing. Often the performance is missing too. But not so on the Outremer 52. This is a boat that grows on you, especially when you see how she copes across a range of conditions. If you're not doing 10 knots, you're probably doing something wrong. And while I'm not here to repeat phrases from their brochure, when they say their boats are blue water performance cruisers, they mean it, and they're not afraid to use the P word.